Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us right now on Morning News Now. Major ruling. This morning, former President Trump is ordered to pay more than $5 million after a jury found him liable for sexual abuse and defamation. But the woman at the center of the case, E. Jean Carroll, is saying about the jury's decision. Plus, reaction from the former president, including his plans to appeal the ruling and how this could impact his presidential campaign. Charged, embattled New York Congressman George Santos is reportedly now facing federal charges. But we're learning about the alleged crimes and what to expect when Santos goes before a judge later today. Confusion and chaos as pressure grows along the southern border. We're less than 48 hours until the end of Title 42. This will put a stop to a controversial border policy that turned away migrants during the pandemic. We'll break down what happens when it expires and how border towns are bracing for a surge of crossings. Also this morning, Top Dog, the Westminster Dog Show, crowns its winner. A pup named Buddy Holly took home best in show, beating out the French Bulldog and Pekingese. We have the other big winners from the show and the can't miss moments. Are you a fan? I am always a fan of the dog shows, but good luck pronouncing the name of this breed. I know. Buddy Holly. Yeah, I saw. But I, <laughs> we, we're going we, we we to say, we don't know what that is. We might have to ask our guests yeah. to do it later on. <laughs> exactly. It's cute, though. We start this morning, though, with the news that former President Donald Trump has been found liable for sexually abusing and defaming the writer E. Jean Carroll. He was not found liable for raping her. Trump was ordered to pay Carroll $5 million in damages after a jury took just three hours to reach its verdict. Carroll's court victory comes four years after she first first made the allegation that Trump raped her in a department store dressing room in the mid-90s. It's an allegation that the former president has repeatedly denied. Here to break down the verdict and what it means for Trump's future is NBC News correspondent Ron Allen, along with NBC News legal analyst Kristen Gibbons-Fedden. Kristen, let's start with you. Help us understand the jury's verdict here, which was reached in about three hours. How do you think they came to this decision and that figure of $5 million? How is that calculated? Well, they found... Trump liable. Um, they really believed what Jeannie Carroll was saying, and they looked at the mountain of evidence and found liability. Now, as you pointed out, they did not find him liable for the rape. So there was obviously some deliberations around the insufficiency of the plaintiff's burden, that they did not find that there was penetration in the way that the judge had described it, but that there was forcible um, sexual contact made with Jean Carroll by Trump without her consent. Now, the jury, when they come up with an award such as $5 million, they consider several factors, her loss of income, the damage to her reputation. And in this case, the jury did make a finding for punitive damages. That means that they found that Trump's conduct with regard to the sex abuse, as well as the defamation, was willful and malicious and with co conscious disregard for Jeannie Carroll. But I think as a civil litigator, I think that the most important part was they really considered the emotional distress and the psychological pain. So though we don't know what the jury actually used to devise this figure, I'd go ahead and bet that it's really the emotional distress and the psychological pain that she testified to experiencing. Ron is on set here with us. Let's bring you in here, Ron. And I want to talk about some of the reaction. We'll pull up a statement released by E. Jean Carroll. It read, in part, I filed this lawsuit against Donald Trump to clear my name and get my life back. Today, the world finally knows the truth. And then on the other side of this, in addition to releasing a statement through a campaign spokesperson, Donald Trump posted this statement on his Truth Social platform where he continued to state that he did not know who Carroll is and called the verdict a disgrace. Ron, tell us more about both sides' reaction to this verdict. Well, they both reacted in what they said on the witness stand or in mm. court. Um, e. Jean Carroll appeared for several days. It was a very emotional time, two days of cross-examination, which at times was very aggressive by former President Trump's attorneys. Uh, former President Trump did not appear in person, but he appeared in the deposition that he did last uh, fall, where he basically says he doesn't know her, this is a disgrace, it's a hoax, so on and so forth. Um, but he also appeared in an Access Hollywood tape, which we've all seen. And uh, the E. Jean Carroll's attorney said basically that that was his confession to this particular uh, allegation. Um, afterwards, uh, Joe Tacopino, um, Trump's attorney, also reacted. Here's some of what he had to say. He's firm in his belief, as many people are, that he cannot get a fair trial in New York City. 
um, based on the jury pool. And um, I think one could argue that that's probably a, an accurate assessment um, based on what happened today. Throughout cross-examination, Takapino tried to tell the jury that E. Jean Carroll and her friends were politically motivated. They, they did not like Donald Trump, put it mildly. And that's what they said was their motivation. But obviously, the jury didn't buy it. So, Kristen, obviously Trump's lawyer there plans to appeal this decision. What does that process look like when we're dealing with a civil case? What would be the arguments, the legal grounds here? So they would probably petition or file a motion for turning the verdict over. Um, in other words, uh, asking the judge to step into the shoes of the jury and overturn that verdict. I can't imagine that will be granted. They'll then go to the higher courts. And I think some of the grounds that they'll probably um, raise will be the use of the deposition footage um, because it was really damaging and specifically the portions that were permitted by Judge Kaplan to be utilized. Um, they may also seek other evidentiary findings that Judge Kaplan permitted, um, such as permission to allow those other women to testify about how Trump also sexually abused them. There was also the mistrial that was made, a uh, motion that was made in the middle of the trial. And so the denial of that mistrial and the grounds for that will also probably be the purpose of their appeal as well. And I think overall, uh, Tacopino had said that the judge was treating him unfairly, and so they'll also look at that as well. Ron, this is the first time that a former president has been found civilly liable of sexual misconduct, but he's not just a former president, he's a candidate again. Are we getting any clues about what this means for the election? Well, we'll see. It's not just this. And, and it is pretty monumental. We, you know, we say this sort of matter-of-factly, a former president found liable for sexual assault, yeah. but that is pretty intense right. when you think about what's happened here. And, um, but it's not just this case. There's a criminal case uh, that Donald Trump faces in New York City. There's another civil case where he's accused of basically fraudulent business practices. There's the Georgia case involving tampering with the election, allegedly. There's the special prosecutors looking at January 6th. And the question is, over the coming weeks and months, whether the weight of that, all of that, mm. will shift the political dynamic. I think people feel very strongly one way or another about former President Trump. And whether all of this moves the needle in one way or another will determine how this, how 2024 plays out. And, um, you know, that remains to be seen. All right. Ron Allen and Kristen gibbons Fedden, thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Well, this morning, embattled Republican Congressman George Santos is expected to appear in a New York courtroom to face federal charges. That is according to four sources familiar with the investigation. Santos has faced pressure to resign from Congress after he admitted to having lied about several parts of his background. For more, we're joined by NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney in Washington and NBC News Congressional Correspondent Julie Serkin. Hello to you both. Thank Thank you for joining us on this. So, Ken, I'll start with you. What do we know right now about these charges and what can we expect in court today? Good morning, Savannah. Well, the charges remain under seal, so we don't know the nature of them. Prosecutors aren't commenting. Santos's lawyer did not respond to our request for comment. We only know that he's been under investigation for some time over a host of matters ever since it emerged that he lied about his resume and biography, principally uh, including the way he funded his campaign. There was a loan of a large sum of money, $700,000 a personal loan that he made to his campaign, and there have been questions about where that money came from. There also have been a host of uh, extraneous allegations made against Santos from sexual harassment to an accusation that he stole money from a homeless veteran that was intended for life-saving surgery for that veteran's dog. So a panoply of issues here. Uh, he, he's expected to appear in court today in, uh, on Long Island in federal court where he'll be processed and we'll learn more about the charges. So can amid multiple investigations, calls, for his resignation from constituents. Santos actually announced his re-election campaign just last month because it's already that time again. I mean, despite all that, put into context for us uh, everything that's going on in terms of all these different investigations and what could potentially come out here, what consequences it could be, especially while he is a representative and announcing a re-election. Right. Uh, other state and local prosecutors have said they are looking into Santos, but it looks like they're going to have to get in line here if the feds are moving this quickly. Uh, and there's also a House Ethics Committee inquiry into Santos. Uh, you know, if he's, it, we're looking way ahead here, but if he's convicted of a crime, that doesn't mean he's out of the House of Representatives. It takes a two-thirds vote to oust him. So uh, he is facing a lot of headwinds, but as an elected representative, he has that in his pocket. Guys. Julie, let's bring you in here. Tell us reaction from fellow members of Congress to this news. 
Yeah, when do we ever find Republicans and Democrats on the same page about anything anymore? But in condemnation of George Santos, we do find Republicans and Democrats saying that he should resign. Take a listen to two of his fellow Republican lawmakers. One of them is actually a Republican in his freshman class that borders a neighboring district, and the other, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Watch. There's a clock ticking, and George Santos should have resigned in December. He should have resigned in January. He should have resigned yesterday, and maybe he'll resign today. Uh, but sooner or later, um, honesty and uh, justice will be delivered to him. I think um, any time that the public's trust is violated in such a way is a profound betrayal of what we seek here to do, which is to serve the American people. But he will have his day in court. I should note one member of New York Republicans, that's Elise Stefanik. She's a member of leadership. She's close to Speaker McCarthy. She has not said anything when it comes to Congressman George Santos. And Speaker McCarthy, by the way, also telling reporters he doesn't believe that he will do anything to force a vote uh, to remove George Santos from Congress. Hakeem Jeffries, who's a top Democrat, also said at this point he's not planning to force that kind of vote. Some Democrats, including Congressman Dan Goldman of New York, said that Speaker McCarthy is refusing to make this move because he needs George Santos's vote. He's the key vote in many key items, including the debt limit fight right now, with Santos being that, that final vote for McCarthy to get his package mm. across the finish line the other week. Ken Delanian, thank you so much. And Julie, you are stuck with us for a little longer for our next segment. Hang with us. Thank you. Well, a tense meeting went down between President Biden and congressional leaders yesterday, and it did not result in any breakthrough in the ongoing debt ceiling standoff. Democrats and Republicans are trying to reach a deal to avoid a potentially crippling economic impact. But the clock is ticking with just a few weeks left before the U.S. faces the possibility of defaulting on its debts. We are joined by NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli, who is here in New York. Julie Serkin is with us again as well. Mike, let's start with you. Uh, there were no cameras in the room, but we're getting a feel for what it was like <laughs> Ten sounds like perhaps an <laughs> understatement. Right. Yeah. Did they make any progress at all? Well, both sides were predicting ahead of the meeting that there wasn't likely to be a major breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It didn't appear that there was <laughs> right. a major breakthrough. Democrats making it clear they still want to see a so-called clean debt limit increase, no strings attached. Speaker McCarthy making it clear there needs to be some effort to rein in spending. Now, the president did talk to reporters after for quite a bit, and he, he made it clear who he thought the sticking point was. He said there was a good conversation among three of the four <laughs> participants. He also laid out what the, state, uh, the next plans are here. Take a listen. We need to take the threat of default off the table. As this meeting and as the meeting ended, <clears throat> excuse me, I suggested we continue to meet and the leaders, uh, our staffs continue to meet and the leaders meet again on Friday to continue our discussions to see what progress we made. Now, there's a real time crunch, as you know. June 1st is coming up quick. And the president has a pretty long trip planned. We're supposed right. to travel with him overseas to Japan and Australia next week. The president, interestingly, did not rule out the possibility that he might have to postpone that mm -hmm. trip in order to make sure these negotiations move forward. Mm -hmm. All right, Julie, let's bring you back in here. So this was House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's first face-to-face -face meeting with President Biden in months. And we know he's touted the GOP plan that passed through the House a few weeks ago, but it does include those deep spending cuts. How did McCarthy feel? And say that the meeting went? Well, you heard how Mike set it up there and what Biden said. He thought that three out of the four participants participated honestly in this meeting. Speaker McCarthy, following that, told reporters that he didn't think it went that great. They traded some jabs inside the meeting. McCarthy stood strong to his positions, demanding spending cuts uh, before even negotiating a debt limit increase. It seemed like both sides in this meeting were pretty uh, harms, hamstrung in arguing their positions. Here's what Kevin McCarthy had to tell reporters afterward. Watch. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together. But I was very clear with the president. We have now just two weeks to go. Now, the meeting did grow tense in some key portions. There was a little bit of a back and forth, whether Kevin McCarthy called the president a liar. He afterwards said he did it. He said what the president was saying was a lie. That's when President Biden brought up uh, what he says Republicans planned on 22 percent in cuts to veterans. McCarthy shot back. This is a key uh, talking point that we've been hearing between both sides, and it's because the House Republican plan does not specify where they would cut, but it's clear that if they're not taking from veterans, that increases the amount they will have to cut from discretionary spending. So bottom mm. line, 
as you heard Mike say there, no movement. Both sides will meet again on Friday. Staff are meeting in the interim, but the clock is ticking to that June 1st deadline. So, Mike, I mean, looking back, we have seen the debt ceiling raised dozens of times under presidents, both Democrats and Republicans. Remind us what's at stake here if they don't reach an agreement. And that's really what's motivating the president here, because he remembers this happened just three times under President Trump without this kind of drama. The White House has laid out all sorts of doomsday scenarios, potentially even eight million jobs lost. The, t the stock market could tank and the government will have to decide what bills to pay. Some people might not see their Social Security benefits, for instance. So the president is putting this squarely on congressional Republicans. That's why I'm in New York, and that's why he's coming to New York. He's going to go to a district represented by a freshman Republican to really say it's up to them to do what past Congresses have done repeatedly, do their duty, raise the debt ceiling. Julie, as lawmakers try to find a way to avoid a default, of course, every vote is going to count. And there's some other news on Capitol Hill. Democrats getting one of those back with the return of California Senator Dianne Feinstein after a month-long absence because of health issues. Tell us the latest on her return. After three months, Senator Dianne Feinstein, 89 years old, the oldest member of the Senate, is set to return today to cast her first vote potentially since February 16th. She's been, missed 90 plus votes. She uh, is a key reason why judges are an issue right now. The only thing Senate Democrats can really act on in moving forward the president's nominees uh, for judicial posts. Uh, but she's expected to return today after a health scare, after a battle with shingles. We heard some back and forth from Democrats and Republicans, uh, primarily uh, some Democrats, notably, who were questioning whether Senator Feinstein was coming back in the first place. Now she returned, we're hearing overnight on a private plane from California, expected to make her first vote today. And of course, with Democrats, one seat majority in the Senate, every single vote counts when it comes to the debt limit, although it's not clear if it will have any impact if Leader Schumer chooses to put a clean debt ceiling on the floor, because we do know 43 out of 49 Republicans currently oppose voting for anything like that. Julie, thanks for covering so much for us this morning. Mike, great to have you in New York with us. Thank you both. Now to the crisis at the border. Cities along the border are bracing for a surge in migrants after Title 42 is lifted at the end of the day tomorrow. The restrictions were first put in place during the pandemic to help stop the spread of COVID. Border officials have used the Trump era policy to turn back migrants who are trying to enter the country. But now with that policy about to be lifted, cities along the U.S.-Mexico border say their migrant shelters are already at capacity and they won't be able to handle the wave of migrants that is expected in the coming days. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now from El Paso, Texas with the latest there. Hi, Julia. Good morning. So El Paso had already declared a state of emergency. Actually, what are you seeing there ahead of Title 42's expiration? Well, you can see some people here, these are mainly single adult men sleeping on the street because they weren't able to get inside this shelter here, Sacred Heart Church, which is really the epicenter of where we're seeing that overcrowding in El Paso. You can see some people waking up this morning on the streets. There's really a kind of a makeshift camp that they formed here. And in El Paso, shelters like this say that they're still waiting for FEMA funding. Uh, that would be to be reimbursed through the county. Shelters like this are getting overcrowded. Um, and then and you also have detention centers that are being run by Border Patrol, where they're temporarily hold and process migrants. Those are also at capacity. And this is before Title 42 lists. It'll be here at 959 local tomorrow night that more migrants can, are expected to come across because now that those COVID-19 restrictions will lift, they'll be allowed to come here and claim asylum. Now, the Border Patrol is surging resources to this. We know DHS, ICE, everyone is surging as much money to this as possible. But what they can't get around, no matter how how they change resources, change policies, is that it will simply take longer to process each migrant. When you can't quickly turn them back and you need to hear about their individual case, that means longer processing times, overcrowding, and potentially more migrants being released here on the streets. I will say, though, something has changed in El Paso just in the last 24 hours. Yesterday, DHS conducted what they called an enforcement action, handed out a flyer to people sleeping just like this along the streets, telling them to turn themselves in to be processed. Many of them had come in without ever talking to Border Patrol. But then after being processed, they could then possibly be released into the United States or sent back into Mexico or potentially deported. But it really cleared out a lot of these streets ahead of that expected surge. Yeah. So, Julia, I mean, as you know, we're already seeing a rise in migrants ahead of Title 42 mm -hmm. being lifted. The shelters already over capacity. Now we expect more. What is the resource situation there like right now? How can they sustain operations? Mm -hmm. 
Well, certainly the city is trying to do what it can. They're supposed to open another shelter today with more beds, but they say they still need money to be paid back uh, from FEMA to them because really this is a federal responsibility, immigration being a federal law, and it shouldn't be falling on their budgets, they say. And then you also have the federal resources. We know that the Biden administration just searched 1,500 active duty troops down to the border. Of course, they will be here in a supportive role. They won't be actually arresting or interacting with migrants, but they are supposed to basically free up more men and women from Border Patrol to go out and try to apprehend migrants as they expect this surge to come across. And in the long term, they're trying to set up more pathways for migrants to apply for asylum in their own countries rather than taking the risky step to come here. But again, it's hard to imagine how they get around the issues of overcrowding when more migrants come and it takes longer to figure out whether or not they have the right to stay here. Julia, just quickly, we know the Biden administration had previously released a plan highlighting changes they're making at the border after Title 42's expiration. Walk us through some of the big parts of that. That's right. So that includes expelling migrants more quickly, trying to get them rapidly through the process. It includes those troops we talked about. It includes ways that they will try to make migrants ineligible for asylum if they didn't claim asylum in a country on their way here. Basically trying to raise the bar, show that the border is not open and get more people here to handle this situation as a humanitarian crisis looms. All right. Julia Ainsley at the border for us. Thank you so much. Severe weather could bring flooding to parts of Texas today. For more on that, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Which means Angie Lastman is with us and tracking everything this morning. Hey, Angie. Hey, guys. It's a soggy morning for southeast Texas, and we're going to see multiple rounds of this heavy rain working through. We've already seen that in the past 24 hours, and there's more on the way. We've woken up to a whole lot of lightning associated with these thunderstorms that are kind of sitting right along that Gulf Coast in Texas. This is the area that we're going to look to for flooding concerns through the afternoon hours today into the evening and through Thursday. We'll keep this threat for uh, at least through tomorrow since we do have more rain on the way. Rainfall rates will be quite impressive, anywhere from one to two inches per hour. So no surprise if we see some of those uh, creeks and streams dealing with some excessive runoff from all of this rain. It does include parts of Louisiana into parts of Texas. We do have the Houston metro area included into that. Uh, and we already know that they've had issues with flooding, not just in the past, but in the past 24 hours as well. When this is all said and done, really, we're going to see plenty of rain focus mainly across parts of Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana. One thing to note, Texas was dealing with a drought uh, before this week started, so it'll be quite impressive to see how that drought plays out over the next week or so once this rain works through. But of course, when we're seeing localized amounts up to three to maybe five inches, that could be problematic for the flooding concerns, and that's exactly what we'll deal with in this area. Now, this is all part of a storm system that's going to continue moving its way across the country. As we get through the, the afternoon hours, we'll start to see some of these thunderstorms firing up in parts of the plains. That's where we're going to look for the severe weather through the day today. Then as we get into tomorrow, that'll shift a little farther to the east. Still parts of the plains, but a little farther uh, out towards the east. Now the southeast, we'll see some of those showers and thunderstorms impacting folks uh, through tomorrow. So that'll be something to watch, but it's not so much the severe weather that we'll see there. The storms will track into the Mississippi Valley by the time we get into the last day of our work week, but we'll still be dealing with heavy rain from Wyoming to the Dakota. So kind of an unsettled forecast for us over the next couple of days. That severe threat for today, though, this is the area that we really want to watch. It goes from Rapid City, including Casper, North Platte, Scott City, and uh, as far south as Texas. We'll see 5 million people at risk of once again, guys, seeing this baseball size hail. You can see the Ugh. pinpoint of where it is. Denver is included in mm. that. So if you live in the Denver area uh, and far out east, you're going to notice that we'll have the, those thunderstorms this afternoon, but the biggest threat will be the hail. And stay on guard tomorrow, too, because 6 million people will be included in that severe threat in into the afternoon and evening hours of Thursday. Once again, all the all the same kind of hazards, the hail, mm -hmm. the wind, tornadoes, not quite as likely, but we could see a couple of those into uh, the afternoon hours tomorrow as well. All right. Ugh. Thanks so much, Angie. Appreciate it. Something going on. Thank you. Coming up on Morning News Now, growing violence in the West Bank this morning. We're going to take you to Israel next, where more than a dozen people are dead after new rounds of airstrikes. Now there are concerns this increase in violence is a sign of things to come. Stay with us.
Welcome back this morning. There's more violence in Gaza as Israeli jets pound the Palestinian enclave for a second straight day. Yesterday's airstrikes killed at least 15 Palestinians, local health officials said, four of whom were children. Well, over in the occupied West Bank, Israeli forces shot and killed two Palestinians during a raid earlier today. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv with more on all this. Raf, good morning to you. Let's start with the situation in Gaza. What's the latest there? Well, Joe, good morning. As we speak, Palestinian militants are firing wave after wave of rockets into Israel. Here in Tel Aviv, we just heard the sirens going off a couple of minutes ago. We could see smoke trails where Israel's Iron Dome missile interceptors had shot down a number of these rockets. The Israeli military says 60 rockets at least have been fired in the last hour. There are no reports of casualties yet on the Israeli side, but there has been at least one direct hit in the southern town of Stirot. And there is a feeling that this is only the beginning. These rockets are retaliation for those Israeli strikes you mentioned yesterday. Israel's military killing three senior leaders from the militant group Palestinian Islamic Jihad, but also 10 civilians, including those four little kids, the youngest of whom, guys, was a five-year-old girl. At this point, it appears that the rockets coming from Gaza are being fired by Islamic Jihad on its own. It is not clear yet if the much bigger, much more powerful militant group Hamas is also going to swing in behind them. But if they do, this could be the beginning of some very intense fighting here, guys. And Raf, then tell us about that Israeli raid in the occupied West Bank. What happened there? Yeah, Savannah, so this is the north of the West Bank. It's near the flashpoint city of Jenin. Israel's military says its troops came under fire from Palestinian gunmen early this morning. They say they returned fire, they killed two gunmen, and they confiscated a number of weapons. We don't know if there's a direct connection between what happened in the West Bank and what happened in Gaza, but in our experience, violence in one part of the Holy Land usually spreads to another, and groups like Islamic Jihad have a presence not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. Guys. So, Raf, this year more than 100 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces. This latest round of violence, does it seem to be a sign of things to come? And are we seeing any international pressure to de-escalate? Yeah, guys, unfortunately, this year is shaping up to be one of the bloodiest since the early 2000s here. Uh, constant flare-ups in Gaza, constant fighting on the ground in the occupied West Bank. There is a lot of concern here that what happen what's happening in Gaza may not be one of these sort of eight hours of shooting and then everybody goes home, that potentially we are looking at days of fighting here. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu really warned the Israeli population last night to be prepared for a lengthy conflict. And Islamic Jihad and Hamas have said they are determined to avenge the deaths not only of these militant commanders, but also of those civilians. Guys, we're hearing distant thuds right now, mm -hmm. which suggests that there may be more interceptions happening over Tel Aviv. So we'll keep you posted. Guys. All right. Please do, Raf, and please stay safe. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for your reporting from Tel Aviv. Thank you very much. Well, more international news now. At least four people are dead after a gunman opened fire near a synagogue in Tunisia. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga joins us with this and other news from around the world. Claudio, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. That's right. A guard stationed at the port of Jerba first uh, shot a colleague dead. Then he seized this ammunition and then he went to the island's uh, synagogue where he again opened fire there before he was killed by security. And now the island of Jerba, Jerba is home to Tunisia's main Jewish community and to one of Africa's oldest synagogues. The country's foreign ministry said two civilians were also killed and 10 more people were injured but did not speak specify whether they were all shot by the attacker. The attack comes during an annual pilgrimage that attracts thousands of visitors from around the world to Jerba. Now let's go to the UK where a trial in which the newspaper publisher Mirror Group is accused of gathering unlawful information on a number of celebrities is about to begin. Among those expected to give evidence in person is Prince Harry, who has already made an appearance in court in March for a similar but separate claim against another newspaper publisher in the UK. Other celebrities involved include the former Girls Aloud band member Cheryl, the estate of the late singer George Michael, as well as soccer players, television presenters and actors.
and finally to Germany, where a law that will make it easier for people to legally change their name and gender was presented by the government on Tuesday. Until now, those who wanted to do so had to go through assessments from two experts, including a physician, and the final decision will then be taken by a court. If the new so-called self-determination law is approved, adults in Germany will be able to change their first name and legal gender at registry offices uh, without, firm, without a former, <laughs> further formalities. Back to you. <laughs> All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Claudio. Coming up, a major change for breast cancer screening. Women are now being told to start getting mammograms at 40 instead of 50. Why doctors are making this change and why some may need to get more frequent screenings. Stay with us. We're back with some important updates for women and when they should get breast cancer screenings. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force issued new guidelines this week. They call for women to get their mammograms starting at age 40 instead of 50. They also recommend that women need to start talking with their doctors about breast cancer screenings when they turn just 25 years old. These new recommendations align with groups like the American Cancer Society. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel for more on this. Dr. Patel, it is so wonderful to see you. Thanks for joining us. And I I'm excited to talk about this with you because it's such important information. As someone in my early 30s hearing that 25, I'm like, what do we need to be doing at this point? So walk us through these details and how this decision was made. Yeah, Savannah Joe, these are big changes since 2016. We haven't had updates to these recommendations. Basically, bottom line is that they recommend all women should start screening for mammograms at the age of 40. Do that every other year until the age of 74. So this is a shift from previous recommendations, which were to move these a little er later in life. So 40 every other year to 74. Hmm. So I know some doctors are concerned the task force did not issue separate guidelines for women with dense breasts. Are there any women who right. might need more frequent screenings? And also are there women who are exempt from the new guidelines? Yeah, Joe, so they talk about a lot of this and unpack their evidence. And I think there were three things that led to these new guidelines, with their, which are worth noting. They found that in their new modeling that if they moved this screening earlier to the age of 40, they could pick up more cancers. That's an obvious one. But to your point, Joe, about dense breasts and other screenings, they felt like moving this up earlier would also contribute to picking up some of these cancers. To your point about some mammograms not being great for breast breasts that are denser. The FDA, interestingly enough, recently also changed guidance to the machinery that we use for mammograms to try to alleviate some of that. And then on your final question about who should be exempt from these guidelines, Savannah mentioned that we should all be talking about this at the age of 25 with our doctors, and I should be talking about this with my younger patients. But if you have a genetic carrier risk factor, the BRCA1 or 2 gene, or a high risk in your family, again, talk to your doctor, you are exempt from these guidelines. These are broad guidelines. I like to say to patients, I make suggestions, you make decisions. We do that on an individual basis. Oh, I like that a lot. And Dr. Patel, black women are 40% more likely than white women to die from breast cancer. Will these new guidelines help to close that gap or are there other factors that, that we need to start considering? Yeah, the task force went short of actually carving out recommendations for women of color, particularly black women. This comes on the heels of some recent data that showed that if black women had been screened earlier for previous guidelines, there could have been more cancers detected, more deaths mm. prevented. So the kind of idea here, Savannah, is that moving the age younger to the age of 40, while it's not meant to be a catch-all, and again, everyone should talk to their individual doctors about their risks, that it does help women of color, particularly black women, where we do see some earlier presentations. A little caveat here, I like to remind patients to try to do this every year, like on their birthday. So some of us are trying to figure out how can we help patients remember every other year. So we're going to have to work through some of those things. But moving it to the age of 40 is something everyone should discuss, no matter maybe, what age you are. Maybe just celebrate your birthday every other year. <laughs> there you go. I, I like that idea. All That's right. a good idea. I like that. You can age half as <laughs> yeah, quickly. Right. <laughs> Dr. Kapita Patel, thank you very much. Great conversation. Coming up, a small moment during King Charles' coronation is causing a major stir. Why a diamond given to Queen Camilla has created a controversy thousands of miles away. You're watching Morning News Now.
comeback in Britain, a small piece of history is causing some major uproar. It all comes down to a missing diamond from the crown that was presented to Queen Camilla during Saturday's coronation ceremony. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer takes a look at the controversy surrounding the famous Kohinoor diamond. Gold, jewels, diamonds everywhere. God save the king! But in all the pageantry of the king's coronation, one significant piece was missing from Queen Camilla's crown, which featured dazzling stones for sure, but not the famous Kohinoor diamond, the 105 carat jewel in the crown made for Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother for a coronation in 1937. A centerpiece of the crown jewels since the 19th century, during British colonial rule of the Indian subcontinent. The earliest records of the Kohinoor diamond place it here in Delhi, in the jewel-studded peacock throne of the Mughal Empire. For centuries, the treasured gem was passed around, and as the story goes, brought calamity with it. But when Buckingham Palace announced earlier this year that Queen Camilla would not don the Kohinoor, it was less about a curse than to sidestep controversy and growing demands for Britain to give it up. Seems to have woken up and be working its, its dark magic again. Who really owns the Kohinoor is a riddle that reaches back centuries. But understanding where it is now is a journey that starts here in India, passing through Mughal, Persian and Afghan empires, and the first Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, who received it as a gift. Britishers documented this, then this, they made it. Sandeep again, Singh Sukarchakia, a lawyer here, claims to be a descendant no, uh, and says his that, family uh, is pursuing the Kohinoor to fulfill the Maharaja's dying wish. This matter is between two royal families two royal families. What makes the claim of your family more legitimate? The Britishers have taken it illegally. So this doesn't need any legal action. It's just a polite reminder that you are the custodian of this diamond, right? And you should give it back to us. But after Britain's East India Company annexed Punjab in 1849, the young Maharaja then signed a treaty that gifted the jewel to Queen Victoria. Kohanur, meaning mountain of light, became a symbol of empire. And in a sense, the Kohanur symbolizes that. It's one in one tiny little package, as big as an egg, uh, is all the hurt, all the feeling of, of loss, all the feeling of theft. Uh, which many Indians now feel about the colonial period. Giving back the Kohinoor isn't a new debate, but it's louder now with India's rise as a global power. Few have been as determined as Vinod D'Souza. It is not possible to reply to every letter sent to the Queen or... He's written 101 physical letters to Buckingham Palace and to the Queen herself. This is my first letter which was uh, sent to the Queen and she replied. In 2009, yeah, yeah, you 2000. got a reply. Yeah, yeah. She holds it on behalf of the nation and that they can't do anything about it. He says he will keep writing to King Charles until the Kohinoor is in its rightful place. Do you think it'll come back? Uh, I know it's an impossible task, but uh, I have not, not yet given it up because uh, I have made it as a passion till I'm alive on this earth. How far are you and your family willing to go to get the diamond back? After me, my son is going to take care of it. And after him, his son is going to take care of it. It will be continue until it is achieved. We will not rest until our target is met. All right, thank you, Janice. Financial headlines now. Elon Musk could make, make sliding into those DMs on Twitter a little more private. CNBC Markets reporter Pippa Stevens joins us now for more on that and some other money news. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. While well, Elon Musk says Twitter could launch encrypted direct messages today as he outlines plans to upgrade communication features on the social media platform. Encrypted DMs means only the sender and receiver are able to see the message. Musk also says voice and video calls will soon be added to Twitter so users can talk to people anywhere in the world without giving them a phone number. Meantime, Uber has launched flight bookings on its app in the UK. The Financial Times reports it's part of the ride-hailing company's push to become a travel super app. 
It would let customers book a complete journey across multiple forms of transportation. The UK is serving as a test ground for these efforts. Uber has already rolled out train and bus ticket bookings there. A benefit of flight bookings will be to funnel more users to Uber's main business, including by offering discounted rides to the airport. And Air New Zealand plans to rent bunk beds to passengers and coach on long-haul flights for about 100 bucks an hour. It's installing the beds on the Auckland to New York and Auckland to Chicago routes in 2024. A four-hour session will probably cost between $64 and $95 per hour. There are six beds in a pod and each will have a pillow, sheets and blanket, earplugs and reading light. You'll be limited to one booking per flight and time limits will be strictly enforced. Not going to lie, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. It does sound good, although do you get a discount if one of the people in your pod is snoring? Ah, that is true. <laughs> and I wonder what the time limit would be. You know, you like go in there for a little nap, you have to get up and change it out. It's kind of weird, but kind of awesome. <laughs> We're intrigued to know more. All right, yeah. Pippa, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Well, coming up, one of NASA's newest missions is actually keeping them right here on Earth. We'll take a deep dive to show you how some of the top NASA scientists are using their skills to understand climate change. Plus, from hounds to poodles to Frenchies, judges at the Westminster Dog Show had the <laughs> rough job of picking a winner. We'll have more on the pup who took the top prize and the other big moments next. Dolly Parton fans, including me, are getting very excited about her new album, Rock Star. The country star tweeted out the fabulous cover yesterday. The album is inspired by Parton's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and features a staggering 30 tracks, including covers and originals from some of rock's biggest names. In the album, she actually covers Let It Be with the two surviving Beatles, Sir Paul McCartney and Sir Ringo Starr. Also featured on the album, Sir Elton John. Sting, Lizzo, and of course, Parton's goddaughter, Miley Cyrus, and many more. Listeners can get a taste of what's in store tomorrow when the first single from the album, World on Fire, is released. But you're going to have to wait a while until November 17th huh. for the full album. Remember, she was a little hesitant, initially said she shouldn't be inducted in the Rock and Roll yes. Hall of Fame. Then she was convinced that she should. And then in all that, she decided, well, I'm going to make a rock album then to really live up to that title. So, as soon as this news forward. broke, you were the first person I exactly. thought of. <laughs> How exciting. So cool. I mean, the list of collaborators on it's, this? Oh, my yeah. goodness. I feel like if ah. Dolly calls you to be on a rock album, you're going to say yes. Yeah, so. it's like, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Well, most of us associate NASA with exploring space, but a group of the agency's scientists are working to study the impacts of climate change in a place you might not expect. NBC News correspondent Jacob Soboroff has the details. Hey there, NASA's scope includes a lot more than just outer space. We traveled with the team off the coast of California, where scientists are trying to better understand how eddies and whirlpools and currents on the top of the ocean, the ocean surface, might be impacting the Earth's climate. Our journey begins at NASA's Ames Research Center in the heart of Silicon Valley. Here, scientists are on a mission to study the ocean surface like never before. And to do that, they'll need to take one of these. What's up, everybody? <laughs> What should I expect? We're going to fly about 20 north-south lines over the Pacific. Should be real enjoyable. In order for your safety, we want to have you in a NASA flight suit. In a flight suit. So uh, get that on. All right, got to follow orders. We'll put this thing on. NASA's S-Mode mission, short for Sub-Mesoscale Ocean Dynamics Experiment, don't worry, I didn't understand it either, deploys a fleet of aircraft, ships, and marine robotics to observe how eddies, whirlpools, and currents interact with the atmosphere and will ultimately shape the Earth's climate. NASA's deemed this work critical because while the surface makes up only 2% of the ocean, it's where nutrients, gases, and heat all converge, and that contributes to Earth's greenhouse effect. Holly Bender is NASA's lead scientist on today's mission. Check this out. What Holly's looking at right now is what? It's the little portal that you're going to do experiments through? Yeah, it's, it's the window to our instruments. So that's what to be looking down at the ocean. You basically got to make sure that it's clean. Squeaky clean. And after a series of final checks, we're cleared for takeoff. All right, we're off to the races. We're heading out over the Pacific. We're going to take a look at what's happening out in the ocean. Holly and Regina got their instruments up and running. Only a matter of time before uh, experiments get underway. The plane flies at an altitude of 39,000 feet and crisscrosses a patch of ocean 100 miles off the coast. But in order to collect data, the equipment requires clear skies above and below. There's plenty of clouds down there right now, and that's not an ideal situation for 
the instruments and get the measurements that they want. So we're going to continue to head west until we get to an area that doesn't look as much uh, like we see down below us right now. Up in the cockpit, pilots Greg Slover and Brian Baxley work in lockstep with the scientists. We're going to be directly over uh, clear blue ocean, and we really don't want clouds above us either, do we? That's right. That also affects their data collection ability because they need that sunlight glint off the uh, waters. A few minutes later, we found exactly what we were looking for crystal clear conditions. With our instrument, we get this really, really high resolution color image of the ocean. And so would that be considered part of the weather of the ocean, what you're looking at? Exactly. So very similar to how you have different fronts moving through, that's exactly what we're looking at in the ocean. After about an hour executing the flight plan, Holly and Regina Eckert put the finishing touches on their research. So we're on our final line right now? Final line of the day. You can't see it with the naked eye, but once we get back down on the ground and analyze all the data that was collected, that's what you're going to be able to see. Yeah, we could see, clear. we could see, uh, you know, amounts of chlorophyll or uh, phytoplankton. So at this point, we'll stop recording, and that'll do it for today. We've stopped recording on our final line, so you are clear to maneuver. Copy and confirm it's just RTB from here. RTB, copy. Okay, coming right. Return to base, right? Am I right? That's it. Yes. <laughs> you're hired. NASA's only been flying this particular S-mode mission since 2019. It's already generated useful data, though. Over time, it's going to help inform scientists about the role the ocean surface plays in our climate. Back to you. Jacob, thank you so much. What a cool look at that. That's awesome. Well, look, out there is a new top dog in town. Yeah, a dog named Buddy Holly took best in show at the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show Tuesday night. The first dog of his breed to win the top honor, which often goes to a dog in the Terrier family. Jennifer Peltz is a journalist with the Associated Press. She's been covering the Westminster Dog Show since 2013. Joins us with more. <laughs> Jennifer, good morning. So uh, we initially had the name of this breed in the script. I know I was not going to get that right, but... This is the first in this breed to win Best in Show, if you dare say the name of the breed, go for it. But tell us more about Buddy Holly and, and why this win was such a big deal. Sure. Well, the breed is called a Petit Basset Griffon Vendéon, uh, but you can just call it a PBGV for short. Oh, I like the dog's that. not going to mind. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, and this one named Buddy Holly is, as you mentioned, the first of his breed to win the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, which is considered the biggest dog show award in the U.S. Uh, and he is a spunky little character, uh, as his breed is supposed to be. They came from France originally, as their name would suggest, and they are traditionally hunters after rabbits, but um, they also are just uh, merry companions that um, his handler, Janice Hayes, would say are definitely independent-minded and have their own ideas about what they would like to do, but often that will make you laugh. And tell us, why is his win such a big deal? And tell us more specifically about this, about Buddy Holly, not just our, what is it, P-B-G? G-V. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are a lot of breeds that have won many times and many more that have never won at all. So whenever that happens, uh, it's always a big deal to the fans of the breed and the people who've been mm. showing them for a long time. Um, he is an interesting dog in his way because he has competed on three continents, four countries, I think, uh, here in the U.S., also in England, Ireland, and Australia. And um, he is named, as you mentioned, for Buddy Holly, the late rock legend, although his breeder, Gavin Robertson, said uh, they chose the name just because he's a buddy. <laughs> and beyond the PBGV, who looks like such a good boy, uh, what are some other noteworthy <laughs> moments uh, from the show this year? Well, there were quite a few interesting competitors, and one of them was a French bulldog named Winston, who uh, was runner-up last year. Uh, and a big crowd favorite. And uh, there also was a Pekingese that belongs to and is handled by a handler who has won with other Pekingese twice in the last 11 years. But, you know, you can go to that dog show and you'll see any dog that could just be the one that you fall in love with. There's a lot of great looking animals out there. How much fun is it to cover this, Jennifer? Yeah, for a decade. So much fun. Um, <laughs> I personally love dogs, so uh, it's super rewarding for me, and I always learn something.
Absolutely. Jennifer, we love when we get a segment where Joe does what he just did. <laughs> He's such a good boy. <laughs> what do you think? Pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jennifer Peltz, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. I bet Lucy could Thanks for having kidding. me. <laughs> <laughs> we could try that. See if Lucy wants to enter a dog show. I always show. say she'd be a really good dog with a job, you know, where she has to focus. And oh, yeah. Okay. She just can't Not be so much any other show. dog in sight. <laughs> yeah, because then derails things. It's a private dog yeah. show. All right. <laughs> that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, the verdict is in. A jury orders former President Trump to pay up $5 million to writer E. Jean Carroll after Trump was found liable for defaming and sexually abusing her. We'll hear from Carroll this morning about the big verdict in her favor. Plus, we've got Mr. Trump's response and how this high-profile civil case could affect his 2024 political chances. Surge protector. Hundreds of U.S. troops are arriving at the southern border. They're being sent there to help with a spike in migrant crossings as that COVID-era border restriction known as Title 42 is set to expire tomorrow. We are on the ground with the latest on those preparations and the stories of sacrifice as migrants search for a better life. Also this morning, we're watching your wallet with the latest read on inflation. We'll dig into that breaking data, what it means for your money, and bigger picture, what it could mean for the Federal Reserve strategy to tamp down on prices nationwide. And we'll end the hour by flipping the script. He's a multi-time Grammy winner and Oscar-nominated composer. Now Terrence Blanchard is taking New York City by storm with his own opera about boxing in one of the greatest tragedies in sports history. It's an so unreal opera. I had a chance to see it a couple weeks ago. I'm looking forward to talking with Terrence, a legendary musician, in a little bit. Opera about boxing. Exactly. Just love that. Can't wait to see the interview. We'll bring you that in a little bit. We're going to start this morning with that major legal ruling against former President Donald Trump, a jury finding him liable for sexually abusing and defaming writer E. Jean Carroll. Trump has been ordered to pay Carroll more than $5 million in damages. Here's NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett with the D details. Hey, good morning, guys. It was a two-week civil trial with almost a dozen witnesses, plenty of evidence to digest, and yet still, that verdict handed down in fewer than three hours of deliberations. After years of denials... It's a totally false accusation. Donald Trump now on the hook for $5 million. Very happy. A federal jury finding the former president sexually abused author E. Jean Carroll in the dressing room of a department store more than two decades ago and later defamed her by calling her story a hoax. But the jury stopped short of finding Trump liable for rape, as Carroll had claimed. Carol in a statement after the verdict saying, this victory is not just for me, but for every woman who has suffered because she was not believed. Overnight, Trump reacting with a series of videos and posts on his social media network. It's a disgrace. I don't even know who this woman is. I have no idea who she is, where she came from. This is another scam. The jury not only heard from Carol, but other women who've accused Trump of sexual misconduct as Carol's attorneys tried to illustrate what they called Trump's playbook, a series of claims he's denied. While Trump's legal team did not call any witnesses and the former president never showed up in court, his words loomed large. It's the most ridiculous, disgusting story. As Carol's team played his deposition tape, the jury watched him confuse a photo of Carol, who he'd claimed wasn't his type, for his ex-wife, Marla Maples. You're saying Marla's in this photo? That's Marla, yeah, that's, that's my wife. He was also confronted with the Access Hollywood tape that surfaced just before the 2016 election. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the put. Resulting in this striking exchange with Carol's attorney. You could do anything. That's what you said, correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the put. Well, that's what, it's, if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been... Largely true, not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. Outside the courthouse, Trump's attorney said an appeal is coming. You know, there were things that happened in this case that were beyond the pale. The jury in this case included six men and three women from all walks of life, all of them remaining entirely anonymous throughout the trial because the judge overseeing the case said he was so concerned about their safety. Back to you. 
All right, Laura Jarrett, thank you so much. Today, anchor Savannah Guthrie sat down with E. Jean Carroll and her attorney, Roberta Kaplan, earlier this morning. Here's what they had to say about yesterday's verdict. Ms. Carroll, first, just your reaction to hearing this verdict and being in the courtroom. I'm overwhelmed, overwhelmed with joy and happiness and delight for the women in this country. Let's talk about Mr. Trump. He said after the verdict, and he was still posting after midnight, that he has absolutely no idea who you are and called the verdict a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time and that you were funded by Democratic donors. What is your response okay. to that? Here's the thing. Here is the astonishing thing about this win yesterday. Of all the cases that this man faces, all the legal quagmires, it was one, well, let's think of all the prosecutors, all the special counsel, all the investigators. And what happened yesterday is one five foot two little blonde, wily female attorney, and one 79 year old five advice. Five foot nine year old. Yeah. Five, five foot nine. Five, five foot nine, <laughs> 79 year old advice columnist beat Donald Trump. What does it mean to you, Ms. Carroll, to have gone through this process, to have experienced what you alleged in court you experienced all those years ago and to have this day come well it is um, it is a moment which before yesterday uh, there was a concept of the perfect victim perfect the perfect victim always screams always reports to the police, always makes note when it happened. And then her life is supposed, the perfect victim's life is supposed to fold up and she's never sort of supposed to be happy again. And yesterday we demolished that old concept. It is gone. Let's break down the case now with NBC News legal analyst Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. So after this two-week trial, the jury only had to deliberate for three hours before reaching its verdict. Did you expect this outcome? I didn't expect the outcome so quickly, Savannah, but, you know, th this is sort of fundamental to our system of justice. Nine jurors had the opportunity to watch E. Jean Carroll testify for three days they got to assess her credibility, her candor, her honesty, and they concluded almost instantly by the time they were sent out to deliberate that her claim wins the day, that she was telling the truth, that she was credible. And it's not so hard to, to believe when Donald Trump's own statements, both the Access Hollywood tape and then him doubling down on his right, because he's a star, to sexually assault women. He actually added that he thought that was fortunate that he got to do it. He said, unfortunately or fortunately, stars get to do it. You know, he essentially confessed that this is his habit, his practice, his M.O. So I wasn't that surprised at the result. I was surprised with how quickly the jury reached that result. So while, while you weren't surprised at the result, the fact of the matter was that she really, she had this burden of proving something that took place nearly 30 years ago. Do you think what you were just mentioning, that Trump's own deposition was the strongest piece of Carol's case here? Was it Carol's friends who backed her up that this, of this claim that she told them right away? Walk us through some of the pieces here that got to this point that you think were the strongest. Yeah, great question. You know, every trial is, is basically assembling a puzzle. No one piece of a puzzle ever shows you what the completed puzzle will look like. So what the defense attorneys are forever doing, appropriately so, this is their job, zealously representing their client, is they ask the jury to look at each piece of the puzzle. And if that doesn't show you what the entire picture is, just discard that piece and go on to the next one. The, the prosecutors or the plaintiff's attorney in a civil case will say, no, ladies and gentlemen, it's a constellation of evidence. You have to wait for all of the pieces to come together to see what picture emerges. So it was not only E. Jean Carroll's testimony, but it was what we call the outcry witness to whom E. Jean Carroll reported this attack within minutes of it happening back in the 90s. It's the two other victims of Donald Trump's sexual assaults who testified. Um, and, and the evidence goes on and on. And the picture that emerged is that Donald mm. Trump absolutely both sexually abused and then lied about what he had done. That's what gave the jury enough evidence to rule in favor of E. Jean mm. Carroll. Glenn Kirshner, thank you so much. We appreciate your legal expertise on this morning.
Now to the latest on the growing crisis on the southern border. With the COVID-era restriction known as Title 42 set to end this week, authorities say they're already seeing an influx of migrant crossing into America. New this morning, the Department of Homeland Security and State Department announced new measures to manage the border. NBC News senior national correspondent and News Now anchor Tom Yamas joins us now from the Mexico side of the border with the latest. Tom, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. You know, when asked what to expect over the coming days, President Joe Biden was very honest. He said it's going to be likely very chaotic. And this is the reason why just behind me, beyond that barbed wire fence is El Paso. And you can see hundreds, if not a thousand migrants, a lot of families here who have been waiting. And, and, and this is somewhat unusual. They're going to try to get in through an access door on the border wall. This is not an official point of entry. Many of these migrants have crossed in here illegally, likely through a hole down the fence, down this river over there that we've seen people coming and going all day. But this is sort of a, a last ditch effort to process these crowds, disperse these crowds that have been gathering both here on the border and in cities across America. This morning, growing confusion and chaos on the border as migrants face a looming Title 42 deadline, now less than 48 hours away. On the streets of El Paso, chants for asylum as border officials here have issued an ultimatum. The message printed on these flyers, turn yourself in now to be processed or face consequences, likely deportation. We've crossed jungles, deserts, rivers and borders, Beckenbauer Franco tells me. He spent months traveling here with 20 other Venezuelans. Now worried if they show up for processing, they'll be turned back. All these people here, I just asked them who here is going to ask for asylum. All these hands you see raised all around me. The change in policy comes amid a historic surge at the border, which critics and border officials have described as growing out of control. Historically, asylum seekers have been granted greater privileges, but Title 42, which expires Thursday at midnight, has blocked migrants from crossing the U.S.-Mexico border to seek asylum, having to wait in Mexico. When it's lifted, some migrants seeking asylum can stay in the U.S. until their status is resolved. The administration also now demanding asylum seekers use an app to schedule appointments or risk being deported. Just across the border in Juarez, crowds gathering, hoping to get into the U.S. before Friday. That's where we met the Serrano family, caked in dust. Their two small children, so where, where tired from? and thirsty. Is this better than what you left? Si, si, Venezuela. The father, Roberto, tells me yes, that Venezuela is very tough right now. We give the family some water and snacks, whatever we have on us. You're going to stay waiting here. He tells me they'll wait until God says that this sacrifice is for their children's future. Now, from our vantage point, there is a, a new law enforcement effort to essentially disperse the crowds. We're seeing it here on the border. We also saw it in El Paso as well. They want to essentially make sure they get whoever is crossed illegally and who's been essentially hiding in the shadows or, or at churches, places of refuge, that they can somehow get them processed. But this is really a quick fix, right? Because once they get processed, many of those migrants who are seeking asylum will then be released and they'll either stay in those border towns or head to cities like New York where the mayor has made it very clear they are overwhelmed. Guys, back to you. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Well, embattled Republican Congressman George Santos is expected in a New York courtroom later this morning to face federal criminal charges. Santos's brief congressional career has been bogged down in investigations, scandals, and fabrications about his background and resume. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig has the latest on this story for us. Hi, Garrett. Good morning. Hey, Savannah. Good morning. Yeah, this is the most serious problem for George Santos yet. Now, the charges against him are still sealed at this hour. But according to sources with direct knowledge of his plans, Santos will turn himself in to face them at a Long Island federal courthouse later today. This morning, calls for embattled Congressman George Santos' resignation are growing as he prepares to face still unknown federal criminal charges, according to three sources familiar with them. Among the loudest voices demanding Santos quit Congress, his fellow New York Republicans. Bottom line is his conduct has been embarrassing and disgraceful. Sooner or later, um, honesty and uh, justice will be delivered to him. Santos' four-month congressional career has been plagued by scandal from the moment he arrived in the Capitol. 
He has admitted to lying about his work history, his education, even his religion, falsely representing himself as Jewish on the campaign trail last year. As I'm a, a you know, son of two immigrants, I am the grandchild of Holocaust survivors and the son of a 9-11 survivor. Immigration records proving the 9-11 claim wasn't true. Santos has denied reports that he is wanted for check fraud in Brazil and that his now defunct charity defrauded an Iraq war veteran who needed money for surgery for his dog who later died. He should be ashamed of himself, but he doesn't have shame. He does. He's a psychopath. But Santos' current legal jeopardy may involve how he funded his 2022 campaign, with sources telling NBC News that federal prosecutors were scrutinizing his financial disclosures and a half-million-dollar loan he reported making to his own campaign. Last night, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy standing by Santos. Should he resign? So I think in America, you're innocent until proven guilty. Support Democrats see as purely political. Why do you think the speaker has held that posture about this member? Well, without George Santos's vote, the debt limit bill does not pass. Without George Santos's vote, Kevin McCarthy's not speaker. And what this is, is Kevin McCarthy putting politics and power over the institution of Congress. And it's a real shame. Savannah Santos basically reminded McCarthy of his position there by being the last Republican to vote when they passed their debt limit bill two weeks ago now. Now, neither Santos' congressional office nor his attorney have responded to requests for comment from NBC News, but the congressman is expected to address the charges against him after he appears in court later today. All right, Garrett Hake, we know you will keep us updated on what happens there. Thank you so much. This morning, it looks like that standoff over the debt ceiling is no closer to being resolved. There was no deal yesterday in what was described as a tense and serious meeting between President Biden and congressional leaders at the White House. Both sides are looking to avoid a potential default that could have devastating consequences uh, for the economy with the June 1st deadline looming. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker joins us now. Kristen, good morning. So even though there was no deal made during the meeting, was there any sign of any progress made? I mean, what happened during the meeting? Maybe a teensy tiny sign, Joe. Good morning to you. Look, publicly there were fireworks after the meeting with both sides appearing to be just as dug in after the talks as when they started. And sources familiar with the discussion have described the tone as tense and serious, as you say. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy accusing Mr. Biden of peddling a lie about the impact of veteran funding if the government were to default. But McCarthy stressed he wasn't labeling the president a liar per se. Still, Democratic sources said McCarthy was rude, he was disrespectful. Here was President Biden's take. I know the speaker says, well, I'm not, he uses the, the, the ill word, the lying word, but uh, says I'm not telling the truth. All I asked him inside was, if you're not going to cut any of those programs and you're saying the cut is 22% across the board, then you're going to have to cut a hell of a lot more with the programs that are left. No, we're not going to do that either. I'm not sure. I don't think they're sure exactly what they're proposing. So, look, bottom line here, Joe, if they don't come to an agreement by June 1st, that date could slip, but that's the date right now, the nation could default, and that would risk financial calamity. But, and this is a very big but, they've agreed to keep talking, and that's where that sign of potential progress is. So yeah. we'll wait and see what happens. Let's talk about that. I mean, June 1st is three weeks from tomorrow. Really, a framework for any deal would have to be put in place well before that. So we've got another meeting scheduled for Friday. Where do we go from here? That's right. All eyes are going to be on that meeting Friday when congressional leaders will be back here at the White House. Now, as a reminder, the president wants to raise the debt limit, which is basically like paying off the nation's credit card debt without any strings attached. Republicans want spending cuts to be linked to any increase. But notably, this is significant, Joe. The president's not ruling anything out, including invoking what's called the 14th Amendment, which in its simplest terms would allow him to address the issue himself. But the Treasury Secretary has warned that move could lead to a potential constitutional crisis, Joe. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on that meeting on Friday to try to get some real progress out of it. And Chris, in looking at today, the president is taking his message on the road. He is here in New York. Tell us more about that and why he's coming to this specific part of New York. He's going to be in Valhalla, New York. And what is interesting is that he won that area in 2020. 
It's now represented by a Republican member of Congress. You can expect the president, we are told, according to White House officials, to basically lay out how he sees the stakes of a potential default, which by all accounts would rock the economy, the stock market. It would impact people's savings and even threaten the loss of millions of jobs. And just taking a step back, Joe, it's just a reminder this is all taking place against the backdrop of his reelection campaign, which very much will depend on the health of the economy. Not overstated to say that President Biden, Speaker McCarthy's jobs could depend on the outcome of this crisis. Joe. All right. Kristen Welker at the White House. Kristen, thank you. And now let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman's here with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. The 80s are back. They're in full force across much of the country as we go through not just today, but the next couple of days. Here's where we'll land today, though. 83 degrees for Kansas City. Check out Minneapolis running 12 degrees above normal for the high today at 80 degrees. I have a feeling some people in Chicago might just make their way to the beach on, with the temperature of 79 degrees. We're going to see these temperatures hanging out in the same kind of range, not just for the Midwest, but even for the Northeast here as we get into tomorrow, we'll see 83 for Cincinnati. Washington, D.C. will hit 81 degrees in the afternoon hours tomorrow. And as we roll into the weekend, that doesn't change. Temperatures will be well above normal, making it to 84 degrees on Friday as we round out the work week in New York. 76 for Saturday in Pittsburgh. And you'll notice these numbers kind of get back to normal or where they should be by the time the weekend ends. In most of these places, we'll be on the cooler side by the time Sunday rolls around with just 73 degrees in New York. So a couple of warm days before we get back to normal. Meanwhile, we've got severe storms that we're watching in parts of the center of the country. We've also got some flooding concerns down through Texas and Louisiana. So let's go there where our satellite and radar shows just a busy and really active morning so far with heavy rain working through. And the problem is this isn't the first round of heavy rain working through places like the Houston metro area. They've seen numerous rounds of rain yesterday, more on the way through the day today, uh, and plenty of lightning as well with those thunderstorms that are kind of hugging that Gulf Coast in Texas right now. This is the area that we do have a flood watch at this time. It does extend into portions of Arkansas, Louisiana, and parts of Texas. This is going to last through the afternoon hours today. We could see it extended potentially depending on how much rain we actually pick up through the afternoon and evening hours today, but those rainfall rates will be impressive. As far as the totals, anywhere from another three to five inches is possible. And let's get one thing straight. We need the rain in this area, but of course we know when it all comes at one time, it yeah. can be problematic for that flooding concern, which is what we're going to watch through the day today. Now, as this system moves to the east, it's slow, but it does continue to bring impacts to other parts of the country. So this afternoon, it'll be the afternoon thunderstorms for the plains, but tomorrow, too, we'll have the risk for severe th thunderstorms through the plains as well. All right. Here, the 80s are back. The 80s are back, <laughs> yeah. baby. In so many it. ways, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate Thank you. it. Coming up on Morning News Now, a disturbing secret allegedly kept by one Utah mother until now. She's the author of a children's book inspired by her husband's unexpected death, but now she's being charged with his murder. The shocking series of events that landed her behind bars up next. We're back with a troubling story out of Utah where authorities say art may have possibly imitated life in a deadly way. Police there say that a mother who wrote a children's book inspired by the grief of her husband's passing may be the one actually behind his death. Yeah, the mother is now in police custody as investigators work to unravel just what led to her husband's death. Here's NBC News correspondent Erin McLaughlin with more. Hey there, while Corey Richens was plugging her children's book about grief, publicly claiming to be mourning her husband, authorities in Utah allege she was hiding a shocking and murderous secret. So my husband passed away unexpectedly last year. A month after promoting her children's book inspired by her husband's death, the widowed mother of three is now charged with his murder. Oh. So you actually wrote this book with your children? I did. Police arrested Corey Richens on Monday outside of Park City, Utah, alleging the 33-year-old poisoned her husband Eric last March with a lethal dose of fentanyl. He had three boys that he loved more than anything. According to court documents, police were called to the couple's home at 3.22 in the morning and found Eric unresponsive on the floor at the foot of his bed. An autopsy later revealing he had five times the lethal dosage of illicit fentanyl in his system. Corey told responding officers she made Eric a Moscow mule, which he drank in the bedroom earlier that night before she went to sleep in her child's room. 
While she claimed she didn't touch her phone until she called 911, investigators say they found phone records indicating she'd sent and received messages that night, which were later deleted. Her seemingly heartfelt sentiments expressed while promoting her book, now seen in a very different light. It's just comforting to them to know that, you know, they're not living this life alone. Like, mm -hmm. Dad is still here. It's just in a different way. According to the charging documents, Corey purchased fentanyl from an acquaintance last February. What she says was for an investor asking for some of the Michael Jackson stuff. Days later, following the couple's Valentine's Day dinner, Eric became very ill and told a friend he thought his wife was trying to poison him. Prosecutors allege Corey then purchased even more fentanyl. And less than a month later, Eric was dead. And Corey, claiming to be grief-stricken, dedicated this book to her husband, calling him a wonderful father. I took things that my kids have said to me this last year and we kind of articulated it and put it into a story. Corey Richens is charged with one count of aggravated murder and three additional felony drug charges. She has yet to enter a plea and her attorney declined to comment at this time. Richens is expected in court next week. Back to you. Oh, quite the talker. Erin McLaughlin, thank you so much for that one. Now to some international news. The death toll is on the rise as violence escalates in Sudan. Let's bring back NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga for the latest on that and some other international headlines. Hey, Claudia, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. The World Health Organization estimates that the death toll from the ongoing conflict in Sudan has now risen to more than 600 people, including many civilians. The WHO also estimates that more than 5,000 people were wounded as factions faithful to two generals have been fighting since mid-April. The conflict between the military and the rival paramilitary group has also led to the displacement of 700,000 people and to a humanitarian catastrophe. Now let's go to Ukraine, where a French journalist has been killed while reporting from the war zone. On Tuesday, Armand Soldin, who, wor who worked for the Agence France Press News Agency, was with other journalists and a group of Ukrainian soldiers near the city of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine when they were hit by a rocket. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, Soldin is the 15th journalist killed in Ukraine since the start of the war in February 2022. And finally, Greece is planning to make its beaches more accessible by installing wheelchair-friendly ramps so that people with disabilities or limited mobility can access and enjoy the sea. The centerpiece of this project will be the remote-operated ramp with a sliding chair that can move beachgoers into the water. The initiative is part of a $16 million project announced by the country's tourism minister that aims to update also restrooms, changing facilities, parkings and snack bars. One more reason to go on holiday to Greece, guys. No there kidding. Have a great idea. Well, All right. Yeah. Claudio, That's awesome thank to you. hear. Thank you. Coming up, the doctor will see you now. It's your weekly medical checkup with all the big health headlines that you might have missed this week after the break. Why many patients are now saying they prefer seeing their doctors virtually instead of in person. And a consumer alert this morning over some popular household disinfectants, the COVID era chemicals that could be hazard hazardous to your health. Next. We are back with your weekly medical checkup. Well, during COVID, we all got in the habit of frequently disinfecting our homes, our packages, things about the grocery fruit, store, yeah. everything. Well, now doctors are saying that you might want to take a look at what is in those cleaners. It might be dangerous for your health. Plus, doctors now say the secret to living longer might be as simple as checking nutrition labels. NBC hmm. News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres is here with us in New York to discuss these headlines. Good morning, Dr. Good John. Morning. Good to have you with us. So, the new research from Moffitt Cancer Center shows people may prefer telehealth over going to the doctor in person. So what patients are we looking at here and, and what's the reason they're giving? And telehealth is one of those things that really expanded during the pandemic oh, yeah. and it's one of those things that's continuing after the pandemic. And this research looked at 39,000 patients. These were cancer patients, over 50,000 visits. And they found out that the patients really like telemedicine, a couple of things. One, they like the visit itself, but they also like the provider responses during the visit. They said they seem to be responding better to them and getting better yeah. information out of the providers, which can 
and cannot work depending on the person itself. So doctor's orders here are pretty simple. Number one, do what works for you because you might not be somebody who telemedicine actually works for. On the other hand, you might be somebody that telemedicine really leans itself towards you because you can do more frequent visits, you don't have to travel, those kinds of things. But in check, but check your insurance coverage because not all insurers are covering them. And now that the pandemic is over, the, we don't know what's going to happen with a lot of these different telehealth visits. Are they going to be covered or not? So just make sure so you don't get surprised. I am an IRL girl. I want to be like, look at this, check this out. <laughs> you know, a lot of people do. And as a <laughs> yeah. physician, it's sometimes getting hands on really helps. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's talk about what we just mentioned with these disinfectants. So, I mean, in COVID, it was everything, everything that arrived at your house, everything <laughs> remember you bought. Remember the, the days of the grocery bag and you yes. leave them out for 24 oh, hours? My God. God. I absolutely <laughs> remember. And I was driving my husband nuts, like, you know, wiping down the light switches, everything. Now, the scientists are warning this might be doing the opposite of keeping us safe. Tell us what we should know. And so some of the disinfectants have a, a container of chemicals in them called quaternary compounds or quaternary ammonias, which are also called quats. And these we have found mm. out through different studies that could be causing some issues. In particular, some of the issues they might be causing are linked to asthma, linked to dermatitis, linked to inflation or inflammation, oh. these types of conditions. So you want to be very careful because they're found in antimicrobials, disinfectants, and sanitizers. So what can you do? What are doctor's orders here? Well, first and foremost, you know, make sure you know know what you're cleaning, why you're cleaning it. Remember, soap and water may be sufficient. Mm. Soap and water are wonderful, wonderful cleaners. Be a label reader. Some of the things to look for, benzoconium chloride, names that end in ammonium chloride. If it says antibacterial or antimicrobial, it might be, and you might have to Google what the ingredient is just to make sure. But if it is, you know, think about getting other things and substituting it for something oh else. All right. Soap and water again. Okay. <laughs> Soap and water. We know you well, can find that. The ones that you That's know are the worst find. are the ones that you think are like, oh, good, I'm really killing everything. Right. And right. it does. Right. It, it <laughs> does kill things. Unfortunately, it might be a bit too much. But yeah, yeah. overkill. All right. Finally, we want to talk to you about those looking for an age defying diet. They may want to check out the amount of fat they are eating. What more can mm. you tell us about this? So, this is one that looked at adults ages 50 to 71, over 370,000 of them, and looked at their diets and saw how long they lived after their diets. And they found out that those that had healthy foods during those ages, ate healthy diets, and by healthy we mean low fat, not low carb diets, they ended up lengthening uh. their, lives, their lives. So those low fat diets, the plant-based proteins, whole grains, limited saturated fats, those are the ones that seem to help the most. And again, not knocking on any of these other diets, but these are the ones that help the most. So what can you do? What are doctor's orders? Well, first and foremost, one of my big mottos is always everything in moderation. You don't want to overload on any single thing. The other is consider healthy replacements. Consider replacements with some of those parts of the healthy plant-based diet in order to, again, extend your life, stay as healthy as possible. And that's the bottom line to all this. So, I mean, like I do an avocado every morning, which is a, considered a healthy yeah, fat. Yeah, it's a healthy fat. Yeah. That's, no, that's, right. that's great. And you do it every morning. You don't do it throughout the day constantly. So you're getting that moderation in there. You're getting that healthy food in there. And you're not necessarily eating those. The concern they have are people who focus on one type of diet that just isolates you to one kind of food. And that's all you eat because that can be problematic. Can we'll we eat stick avocados around all day. after the show so we can review <laughs> our diets and our cleaning products? Just some things she wants yeah. you to see just to check out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, Dr. Torres, as always, thank, thank you so much. You thank you very much. Great to have you here. Well, let's stay on medical-related news. Well, this week is National Nurses Week, and this morning we're investigating contracts that nurses at HCA Healthcare, that's the nation's largest hospital chain, have had to sign. Well, some nurses claim that those contracts not only put them in debt, but are also bad for patients. NBC News senior investigative and legal correspondent Cynthia McFadden has this report. Rum was excited to start her career as a registered nurse at an HCA hospital in California. But soon, she says, her job was making her sick. Yeah. My hair was falling out. I was losing weight. I mean, Jackie, you're almost shaking as you're talking about this. It's like you're a little traumatized. Maybe I wasn't made to be a nurse. Well, in these conditions, I don't think anybody was made to be a nurse. The conditions she's talking about relate to understaffing, which NBC News has investigated at HCA hospitals in five states, where some nurses and doctors say HCA's focus on profits, $5.6 billion last year, can put patients at risk. The quality of care that we give is not what we want to give. She says the hospital refused to let her work fewer hours, so after 13 months, she quit. But she had a problem. She'd signed a contract saying if she didn't work two years full-time, she'd have to pay back some of the $4,000 they said it cost to train her. 
Rum believes it wasn't training, but an 11-week orientation, which included basic onboarding, technical instruction, and shadowing an experienced nurse. We see these contracts as a form of indentured servitude. Bryn O'Neill is a lawyer and policy specialist at the largest nurses union in the country, with over 220,000 members. Indentured servitude. Does that go too far? I don't think so, because it's requiring people to work out a term based on debt. These contracts are sometimes used by hospitals to staff the worst shifts and the sickest patients with the least experienced nurses, according to some of the 1,700 nurses O'Neill's union surveyed. In the past decade, these contracts have been used by a wide range of hospitals, including HCA, which says its training programs are more comprehensive and substantive than any standard job orientation. The other thing HCA and many other hospitals say is there just aren't enough nurses. We're in a nursing shortage. There are plenty of licensed nurses, but there's a real lack of safe nursing jobs. <laughs> In Utah, Bree Fellows also signed an HCA contract. If she quit before two years, she'd have to pay back the $10,000 signing bonus they gave her, as well as up to $10,000 in training costs. Where's the hedgehog? <gasps> Fellows, who had two kids under two at the time, accepted a job on the overnight shift in labor and delivery. But six months later, she was pregnant, exhausted, and begging, she says, to work the day shift. She said, you're brand new. No, you can't. Were there some moments while you were doing this job that you just thought, I'm not safe? I'm not safe for these patients. I'm not safe for myself. Yes. Just like not catching things that I should have, like just staring at the screen at 3 a.m., it's just very scary. After 11 and a half months, she quit. The hospital sent letters demanding she return her upfront bonus of $10,000 as well as $6,000 to repay her training. It was very much a slap in the face, like, like, this has to be wrong. Frightened, she and her husband took out a new credit card and paid the $14,000 the hospital agreed to take. These contracts are bad for nurses and they're bad for patients. With debt hanging over their head, a nurse has a much harder time speaking out. HCA now tells us that since we started reporting on these contracts two months ago, they've decided not to use them anymore though they decline to say whether they will enforce the contracts nurses have already signed or reimburse nurses like Bree Fellows. Meanwhile, the federal government is getting involved. Our thanks to Cynthia McFadden for that report, and the Federal Trade Commission has proposed a new rule banning contracts like these, which are being used in an increasing number of industries. Coming up, breaking inflation data out just moments ago. Yeah, we will dig into the numbers, what it means for your money, and how it could impact the Federal Reserve strategy to bring everyday prices down with our friends, Caleb Silver, Brian Chung, best of the best. That is right after this. We are back with some breaking economic data. That's right. Inflation numbers, they came in at 4.9% on an annual rate in April and 0.4% on the month. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung and Investopedia's editor-in-chief Caleb Silver are here on Inflation Watch, as <laughs> Brian's screen says. Good morning to both of you, Brian. I will start with you. Tell us about these numbers and how they compare to last month's. Yeah, well, again, these are numbers, so we got to contextualize it within what we've seen in previous months. And as you mentioned, the number coming in at 4.9%, that's how much more expensive things got between April of this year and April of last year. Now, if you look at March to March, it was 5%. So it is encouraging to see those numbers go down. But again, what the Federal Reserve really wants to see this number at is somewhere closer to 2%. So right. what's leading to elevated uh, inflation levels? Well, if we take a look at food, energy, and shelter, uh, food actually didn't increase in mm. prices between March and April. So that's certainly good news. Continuing the flatlining that we saw in March, energy did go up a little bit just by 0.06% between March and April. And then shelter, the cost of just putting a roof over your head, did increase by 0.06%. 
4% in the month of April. So again, rent and mortgages mm -hmm. getting expensive, but still encouraging to see that that overall number did tick down a little bit. So Caleb, mm -hmm. inflation moving in the right direction, although quite slowly. What are the big yeah. takeaways from the data that you yeah, out? The thing about inflation and prices, they can go up real fast. It just takes a long time for them to come down. And that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Sticky, high prices around the things that we have to spend on every month. Also in this report, gasoline prices contributing to that little increase we saw in inflation. They're at around $3.51 per gallon on average. Remember a year ago, they were about $4.37. So they're coming down, but they're going to get a little bit more expensive as we go into the summer. But generally, this nice easing of prices is what the Federal Reserve wants to see. And you're probably going to see that reflected in their next decision in June in around uh, 28 days. Who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> I'm not counting. You're counting. We know that. All right, Brian, let's look at some more categories. And I just broke down some that we've seen month over month. But what are we seeing the biggest increases, biggest swings, falling, that kind of stuff? Yeah, what was interesting is that inside food, for example, mm -hmm. the government breaks it out between food at home and then food at home, uh, food away from home. So okay. interesting to see that if you actually dine out, it, it could be getting a little bit cheaper. Food away from home went down by 0.2%, which kind of explains some of the flat line we saw in the overall category. Caleb was just mentioning some of the factors that we've seen in energy with fuel costs going down. And then interestingly, uh, I saw that travel uh, types of expenditures are actually getting a little bit cheaper. <laughs> Airline fares down 2.6% between oh. March and April. And interestingly, hotel and motel rates are going down 3.4%. So maybe getting a little bit cheaper, even headed into that peak summer season. For those who haven't made their plans yet or made, yeah. paid for anything yet. So, Great Caleb, you mentioned there. the Fed. That's kind of what we're all keeping an mm -hmm. eye on here. I mean, Jerome Powell, after the last raise, really didn't give us a hint of what's next. So what are the possibilities now looking toward mm. this next Yeah, year? the Fed says it's always data dependent, and this is a big piece of data. They want to see consumer prices and producer prices, which we get tomorrow, come down to that 2% range that Brian was talking about. But right on the heels of this report is the average hourly earnings report. The Fed wants to bring down average hourly earnings. They want to bring down pay because pay is putting pressure on companies, which then raise prices for consumers, who then back off of spending. That actually is only up 0.1% down 0.5% year over year. So wages are starting to decline a little bit as well. Not great for workers, but this is what the Fed wants. This is all kind of working the way the Fed wants it to. So maybe it doesn't have to raise rates again when it meets in June. And Brian, similar question to you. I mean, just like this number that Caleb just mentioned, we have hour hourly wages that we've got the interest rate. We have jobs numbers, this inflation. What does all of this together say right now about the state of our economy overall? Well, it tells us that Americans are still feeling the pinch, certainly. And when we talk about just even the numbers that by, by category, when you take a look at shelter, this is the largest expenditure for almost all American families, right? Rent and then also mortgage. And these numbers have been going up over time. And you can feel it when you go out and try to buy a house or when you have those negotiations with your landlord for where your rent might be going for the next 12 months. So overall, the story is that because wages are, yes, they're higher certainly uh, than pre-pandemic, it is still not keeping up with inflation. Your wallet is getting pinched even for all those Americans that continue to have jobs in an economy where the unemployment rate is 3.4% mm -hmm historical low, but even those who have jobs are still feeling the pressure of this inflation, the reason why those interest rates are likely to continue and to stay high. You know the dramatic lighting and sound effects that Who Wants to Be a Millionaire when it's like, mm -hmm. da, da, da. we need to do that for like, <laughs> inflation that. watch, yeah, <laughs> or jobs report. I love it. All right, Brian, Caleb, thank you very much. I always appreciate when you're here. Stuff coming up on Morning News Now, it is time to flip the script. Yeah, after the break, I'm going to sit down with Oscar-nominated composer Terrence Blanchard. He's got a new opera about a boxer. We're going to talk about <laughs> it next. Welcome back. Well, everybody loves chocolate and cheese, right? This is kind of next level. After this latest collaboration, confectioner Comparte joined forces with Heinz Crafts Velveeta to make what are called truff vels. Made to look like Velveeta's signature pasta shells, truff vels are a limited time chocolate and cheese truffle, an outer coating of white chocolate infused with Velveeta cheese. A five pack goes for $24.95 on Comparte's website. I mean, cheese is one of my main food groups, Joe. I don't know about this. We'd have to try it to know, I guess, right? right. I guess For maybe. For sure, yeah. to get that answer. Well, let's try it. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Savannah. Yeah. It is time for Flipping the Script, our look at artists on stage, on screen, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. And today we are chatting with composer Terrence Blanchard. The talented musician is a seven-time Grammy winner. He's also been nominated for two Oscars for his film scores. Oh, yeah, and he writes operas. In fact, the first one he ever composed is now playing at the Met Opera. It is called Champion and tells the true story of boxer Emil Griffith. He was bisexual and in the 60s, in what has been called one of the greatest tragedies in sports history, Griffith actually killed his homophobic rival, 
in the ring. We are so happy to have Terrence Blanchard with us now. Thanks for joining us this morning. I mean, when you think of opera, boxing is probably not the first <laughs> thing that comes to mind. Why yeah. tell this story and why tell it through an opera? I, for me, it's it's one of those things. It's a, it's a human story. I, I, a friend of mine uh, who's a heavyweight champion, Michael Bent, told me about the story years ago. And I started thinking about how, with me, when I won my first award, you know, I turned to my wife, gave her a kiss, walked up on the stage with no problem. And I thought about how this guy became the welterweight champion of the world and couldn't celebrate that openly with somebody that he loved. And how just trivial that should be, you know, for us. I mean, we should be well past these issues. And there's something that he said, you know, where he said, I killed a man, the world forgave me, and I love the man, and the world wanted to kill me. And that's a very powerful statement. It's an incredibly powerful quote. I think it's a story a lot of people, most people didn't know about. It happened in the 60s, but are there still lessons we can learn from it today? There's a lot of lessons we can learn from it. First of all, is the whole thing of acceptance. You know what I mean? We're not all going to be the same, you know, but it doesn't mean that we can't accept everybody for what they bring to the table. The other part of it, too, is learning how to forgive yourself, you know, because the thing with Emil is, you know, he did his job. Gene, uh, Benny Peretta had fought a guy by the name of Gene Former two months prior to this fight, and Gene Former was a heavy-hitting guy, so he shouldn't have been in the fight at all. As a matter of fact, he tried to get out of Benny Perrette tried to get out of the fight the night before, and that's when we started to have all of the regulations about the amount of time that we needed in between fights. And Betty Pratt's the one who died yes. in the ring in yes. the meal with Emil Griffith. So mm -hmm. you have said that writing operas is one of the most challenging yet fulfilling things <laughs> that you've ever done. Because you've already had this long, successful music <laughs> career in so many areas. What made you decide to do opera? Lunacy. <laughs> <laughs> you still say that now. <laughs> oh, man, definitely, definitely. Well, no, I mean, Opera Theater St. Louis, Jim Robinson and Gene Dobbs Bradford, who was at Jazz St. Louis, they wanted to try to broaden their audiences over about 10 years ago, and they approached me about putting this together. And I had never thought about doing an opera before, but my father loved the opera. I heard a lot of opera growing up, so I was intrigued. And the thing about working with Opera Theatre St. Louis, they literally stepped me through the process, the workshop process, going from getting the libretto done to writing the, the, the melody lines, orchestration and all of that stuff to where it just really helped me understand the entire thing. And you would call this make more, this is not your standard opera necessarily, it's more of like a jazz opera, is that what you would say? It's, we call it an opera in jazz. We don't call it a jazz opera yeah. because we don't want people to think that this is not gonna be a jazz band playing the entire time. Because it is opera, most definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, Champion's the first one you wrote, but yes. actually back in 2021, you had another one called Fire Shut Up In My Bones, premiered mm -hmm. at the Met Opera. Incredibly, this was the first time an opera by a black composer yes. had actually been at the Met. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to you? And, and what do we need to do, especially in the world of opera, to make sure that more voices of color are having their music and their stories told? Well, you know, it meant a lot to me, obviously. But the thing that, that, that I kept saying was I may be the first, but I wasn't the first qualified. You know, I was the one that got the opportunity. So with the, given that opportunity, I tried to make sure that we didn't leave any stone unturned. Rehearsals were like really arduous. We paid attention to a lot of detail and tried to make sure that the production was as strong as it could be. Now moving forward, it's not just about people of color, but it's also about gender. You know, we want to have all of these voices bring stories, you know, to the Met stage. Because as you see, uh, you know, we've been very blessed in having large audiences for these productions. And I think that's because people are seeing themselves on the stage and they have these stories that they really can relate to. We have about 30 seconds left here, but uh, we I know of two operas of yours. Have you written another one or do you have plans to, <laughs> to write another one? He says, <laughs> he responds with a laugh. <laughs> well, I'm going to get some sleep first, but you know, yeah, there's a third one on the way. We just haven't picked the topic yet. All right. Yes. We're intrigued to see what it is. Let us know when you know. Thank you, man. Terrence Blanchard, thank you so much for joining thank us. You for having me. I've seen it. It is an absolutely incredible opera. I cannot recommend it enough. And you can see Champion. It is still at the Met Opera this Saturday. Terrence, thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks right. for having me. Our pleasure. Right. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. And what a great interview, Joe. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.